We are about to start again, second panel uh, on the state of USA and I trust law. We're going to cover a lot of the questions we did and get a variety of new perspectives, which is very valuable. Uh, again, I'm Alden Abbott, General Counsel of the FTC. Before proceeding, I want to again announce that uh, two of our FTC interns will be handing out questions. Uh, little cards and people may submit questions. And if we don't have the time to get to uh, the time to address the questions uh, audience members have, they will, we are keeping them and we will consider them uh, as we prepare the record. And so don't be concerned, but uh, do feel free to write up your questions. Also, we have a cafeteria next to the auditorium, which is open until 2.30. Let me start out right again and announce the new panelists. So uh, next panel we'll have Debbie Feinstein, who's a partner and head of the Global Antitrust Group at Arnold and Porter K. Scholler LLP, formerly director of the FTC Bureau of, Com of Competition uh, and also an assistant to the director and attorney advisor at the FTC. Michael Cadus is Director for Markets and Competition Policy at Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Previously, he worked as Antitrust Counsel to Senator Amy Klobuchar, and previously, uh, he was an attorney at the FTC, including his attorney, an attorney advisor to Chairman John Lebowitz. I might mention that uh, uh, Mike worked on a number of important pharma matters uh, while he was at uh, the FTC. We welcome again to the panel Professor Bill Kavasik, again professor at GW Law School, former uh, FTC chairman, currently still non-executive director of the UK's Competition Markets Authority. Diana Moss, uh, Dr. Moss is president of the American Antitrust Institute and adjunct faculty in the Department of Economics at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Prior to joining AAI in 2001, she was at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission where she coordinated the agency's competition analysis for electricity mergers. And last, but very certainly not least, uh, Professor Bobby uh, Robert D. Willig, a Professor of Economics and Public Affairs Emeritus at the Woodrow Wilson School and the Economics Department of Princeton University and Senior Consultant at Compass Lexicon from 1988, from 1989 to 1991, uh, Professor Willig served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Economics in the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department. So we're going to follow a very similar uh, format to the first panel. And just for starters, I would like to, and try to keep it brief, but get quick reactions to what you've heard, in particular, uh, you know, the uh, keynote addresses, but also uh, some of the commentary on, on the keynote addresses. Uh, let's quickly go down uh, the ranks. Uh, De uh, Debbie Feinstein. Um, great. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me here. This has been an absolutely fascinating uh, morning so far. Um, you know, listening to everybody, uh, it was fascinating because I expected there to be a lot of discussion about all the ways in which antitrust isn't getting it right because they aren't considering all of these other factors. Uh, in fact, what I heard uh, is that antitrust does cover all of these things. There's just a huge divergence of views as to whether or not the courts are getting it right. So on the one hand, you could completely agree with Professor Hilton that the state of antitrust law is strong in the sense that all the cases we're talking about and we're complaining about are all ones that are in the courts. They're not getting knocked out on motions to dismiss as being unrelated to the antitrust laws. They're antitrust cases. On the other hand, you could um, uh, agree with others, including Professor Fox, who say it's wrong in the sense that the decisions didn't come out the way some folks would like to. But for all the discussion about whether or not antitrust should take into account other factors, something we'll talk about later, the discussion this morning was almost entirely about simply things that are within the box of antitrust. Uh, I think that's where we should stay, frankly, um, for reasons I'll explain later. Uh, and I think there's plenty to talk about there. But when you hear the things 
uh, that we're talking about, that the rules on predatory pricing uh, are wrong, that we should focus more on combinations of big data. Well, that can be taken care of by monopolization. Um, when you think about um, uh, whether we should be, whether you know, we should be thinking about two-sided platforms or one-sided platform. That is an antitrust case. It made it to the Supreme Court. That is within the role of the antitrust laws. So to me, the question is, if antitrust is getting it wrong, if the Supreme Court is making decisions that people don't think are in the best interests, why and what can be done about it? Uh, and I think that's something that we'll talk about as the panel goes on, but I think that's where the focus ought to be, which is, you know, if there's a view that we're getting it wrong and that the economy is suffering, how do we write the course? And, and, and I have thoughts on that that we can discuss later, but um, at, you know, focusing the discussion on that rather than should we recreate the body of antitrust to take into account considerations that are far beyond and really didn't end up being what the panel, uh, the first panel ended up talking about, uh, and I found that fascinating. Uh, Mike Cadis. Uh, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be back at the Federal Trade Commission. It's somewhat like my second home. Um, very honored to be part of this, this panel. And I guess I sort of have taken away two things. First, uh, from Professor Stiglitz's presentation, seems to me really put out a challenge to the antitrust community and said, there's a monopoly problem in the United States and anti the failure of anti the antitrust laws uh, is part of the, is contributing to that problem. And to me, that immediately begs the question is, how do you decide whether an, an institution, an, the antitrust enforcement institution, is succeeding in protecting competition? So you might sort of, this might be called like the trial lawyer's assessment, which is, if I won my last case, clearly the antitrust laws are working. And if I've lost my last case, clearly <laughs> the antitrust laws are to blame. <clears throat> you can sort of look into scholarship. And there's lots of articles sort of talking doctrinally. Um, but I think that sort of misses the larger point that, that Professor Stiglitz is making, is that there's something really going wrong in the American economy. And we need to think about uh, what antitrust's role is in that economy. And, uh, for my, and so I'm going to propose the water is wet test, which is if plaintiffs in the government are consistently having to prove water is wet in court, if they are fighting over the most obvious, very simple, straightforward antitrust matters, then probably the antitrust enforcement laws are under deterring. And when you look at the, the, the Supreme Court and American Express, if you look at the implications of Trinco, if you look at the implications of just last year, the, the FTC spending four days, 1,600 exhibits to block a physician practice merger that went to near monopoly in Bismarck, it looks to me like that's where the antitrust action is in litigation. The cases the government is litigating are not on the, are not on the frontier. They're in what we call the homeland of what, the antitrust. And that seems a very strong indication to me that we are, the antitrust laws are, as they're interpreted today, are failing. Okay, antitrust laws are failing. Interesting uh, pers uh, perspective. Professor Bill Kabasik. Yeah, I, I enjoyed the uh, earlier segments. Uh, they were terrific. I especially liked the second keynote. That was, uh, <laughs> was a real highlight for me. So uh, uh, just uh, giving you a quick assessment. Uh, um, I, 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 one, one thought about the, the discussion of aims and what the agencies do and how they think of things. And uh, I've spent time looking at the budget requests of the two agencies going back about 50 years, where each year they have to go before Congress and justify the sums that they'll be given to enforce the law. And those requests, I think, say a lot about the agency's own perception of what their aims are, uh, certainly interested in basic questions of economic performance, uh, innovation, pricing. But there's always been a component involving distribution and equity to them. Uh, to take the FTC as an example, uh, how do you suppose the Commission has sought funds from Congress to carry out its competition program? It's always identified what were called at different times market basket issues. Uh, we're interested in energy, food, health care, and a set of other concerns. There's never a budget request that says uh, we're really concerned about the overpricing of luxury yachts. Uh, so we're going to focus a lot of attention on the, on the yacht sector. Uh, all of the budget requests to the Commission, and certainly those of the Department, uh, focus fundamentally on delivering good results to average citizens. 
So embedded in that, I see a, a basic concern about distribution, about equity. Uh, the major program that the department developed over time involving public procurement, uh, the principal beneficiaries of improvements in public procurement performance that would have come about as a consequence of the department's anti-cartel program are, for the most part, people on the second half of the income distribution. Uh, so uh, if we ask, has competition law been concerned with equity, with distribution, I would say the way in which the agencies have allocated resources over time would say decisively yes. Now they've done this in the context of the admittedly amorphous consumer welfare standard. And if you were skeptical of that, you would dismiss it as a slogan that's deliberately designed to obscure different difficult policy choices. But under the framework of focusing on consumers first and foremost, they've built programs that in many ways encompass a fundamental concern with, with equity and distribution without labeling it as such, but that has been the overwhelming center of attention when it comes to formulating budget approaches. The agencies, when they have brought cases outside of that zone, have invariably done it to establish a doctrinal point. Uh, Polygram deals with concert performances. Uh, uh, is that, is that, a, is that a, a key distributional impact concern? Well, I suppose wealthier people tend to go to those conferences, con go, go to those concerts and get tickets, but there was a crucial doctrinal aim there, which was to rehabilitate a rule of reason that had taken a serious blow in California Dental, uh, followed up by other cases to do the same. So if you look at the wide range of cases that the agencies have brought over time, especially those within what might be called their larger zone of discretion for setting priorities, this has always been in the back of their minds and I think competition law, priority settings done a good job of having that first and foremost in their minds and deciding what to do, even though the technical tools that are used might focus more and more specifically on this large category of concern called consumer welfare that attentiveness to the concerns of average citizens, especially those with perhaps less than average means, I think has been a, a perhaps not explicit, but uh, a very visible element of what the agencies have done. Okay, uh, Diana. Uh, yes, thank you very much for inviting uh, me here today. Uh, it's been a terrific discussion so far, and um, I'm actually surprised uh, but heartened to hear more uh, consensus on some key underlying issues, uh, but still some areas of disagreement. So I, I view that as progress being made in our community, in the antitrust community, the policy community to um, deal with these issues moving forward. Um, I guess a few takeaways from this morning's conversation. One is, um, you know, I, I think that uh, we have a debate going on in the, in the antitrust community over the perils of high concentration. Um, these warning signs have been around for a long time, as Professor Stiglitz noted back even to the, to the 70s. Um, there's there is a, a very interesting debate going on between economists in the antitrust community about whether uh, more aggregate measures of concentration are actually relevant to antitrust analysis. So, you know, my view on that, I've just written an article coming out in the antitrust magazine on this, is for the, for the, uh, in the I.O. economists to engage actively in this debate, not, not to be naysayers or put their heads in the sand, but to actively engage and figure out ways we can map over high levels of aggregate concentration to what's going on in antitrust markets. Because relevant markets in antitrust, many antitrust markets are very highly concentrated. We should be figuring out ways to add to the debate, to uh, develop a constructive agenda moving forward. The labor economists and the macro economists are, are way ahead, way ahead of what's going on in the I.O. field. Second, um, what I'm hearing today um, really um, fits nicely or neatly, if you will, into um, a, a concept of the antitrust laws that uh, has been driven by static analysis versus dynamic analysis. If you, if you count the number of times you heard dynamic up here already today, it's a lot. And that says something. So we have approached antitrust in this country uh, for many years in a very static way. Um, but we have lost track of the dynamic effects of uh, mergers and, and uh, in, in um, uh, 
uh, in, a, in a building market power and accumulating market power. We have lost track of the, the fact that uh, uh, avoiding false positives and using decision theory is a very static approach to doing antitrust. Um, there, there are many other examples, even down to looking at mergers and looking at static price effects on one hand uh, versus dynamic efficiency effects on the other hand. So these things don't match up, and I think we're seeing the tension and the, uh, the, the adverse outcomes that are coming from a misalignment of using antitrust in a static way uh, with a static vision versus a longer-term dynamic vision. And then finally, I think there are definitely policy needs and prescriptions on the table here. Um, absolutely. Um, we need to be asking, what lines can we no longer cross? Lines have been crossed. That's why we're having the, the declining competition problems we have now. So do we want to think about requirements? Requirements, for example, to show efficiencies, to, to require companies to show efficiencies in merger cases. Do we want to think about requirements that savings, cost savings, be passed on to consumers? Do we want to think about the effectiveness of remedies? And this, this links back to the importance of doing merger retrospectives, as Dennis was saying. And do we want to think about a broader set of presumptions in addition to the structural presumption? For example, a vertical merger structural presumption. There's a whole, uh, uh, presumptions on predation. There's a whole host of lines, I think, that have been crossed where we need to give some deep thought to policy prescriptions for addressing, uh, addressing policy responses. Uh, Bobby. Oh, thank you. I'd like to use my opening moments to respond more granularly, I think, to <clears throat> Professor Stiglitz, uh, henceforth Joe. I've known him forever. Uh, and I know that he is wildly prolific and wildly stimulating, and so it would take me and the rest of us days, if not years, to fully respond to his 30 minutes uh, of presentation. And that's sort of the rate of exchange between him and the profession. Uh, he upsets a field, and he fixes it, and then he moves on to another field. He just takes days to do what the rest of us take an entire lifetime to do. So uh, I need to rush through this, but I'll continue on these themes for the next hour if I'm allowed to. So uh, big themes. Joe says that changes in the economy uh, and changes in economics as a field uh, have progressed very importantly in the last, he said, third of a century, uh, and those changes should be reflected in changes in antitrust. In a way, that's uh, the biggest theme that I took away. And I would like to comment on those first. So a major part of the changes in the economy, from my point of view, have been the increasing prevalence of economies of scale, also economies of scope. And I would like to point out that this is not a bad thing in itself, because increase in scale economies is really a concomitant of the fantastic innovations that we've seen, the increases in productivity, the technological progress, the infusion of technology into a wide variety of sectors. It also means, and here I think Joe and I are on the same page, an increasing inapplicability of the old-fashioned beautiful model of competitive equilibrium, which Chicago did not invent but respected more than others perhaps. Uh, so it's only a bad thing in terms of if you still want to rely on your old uh, competitive equilibrium theory uh, when it comes to policy. Uh, Joe, where are you, Joe, are you here? Yeah, hi, Joe. The lights are blinding. Joe, this means that the law of one price is dead. You know that. You probably taught that to me. Uh, it means we can't expect marginal cost pricing, and it's not even a desideratum anymore because you can't cover the fixed costs that underlie scale economies if we hold ourselves to marginal cost pricing. We know as a matter of economic theory that in the presence of important economies of scale, non-convexities in the economy, which arise from scale economies and also from information problems, as Joe has taught the rest of us, means that we need price discrimination or at least differential pricing. We need nonlinear pricing. We need some of the very kinds of business practices that at least some of us uh, in too easy discourse think should be desiderata for competition policy, but no, Complex pricing is an absolute necessity to undergird industries that rely on innovation, that rely on all kinds of fixed costs. And these are good things, not bad things, but we have to recognize the role that complex pricing plays in the modern economy that we have. So more on that later. Uh, second, Joe says changes in economics as a field uh, have not been fully reflected in antitrust. And in a way, I agree, in a way, I don't agree. I mean, it's amazing how 
our field, you say I.O. is a dead field, hey, uh, new great ideas are coming out all the time, and of course there's a small lag between the ideas and them being tested academically and their influence on policy, although it was just, what, one year ago that the idea of merger analysis through bargaining theory hit the American Economic Review, and here's the Department of Justice fully embracing it in the ATT Time Warner case. I mean, talk about fast adoption of new ideas uh, to the credit, I think, of the Department of Justice for picking up on that idea. By the way, also congratulations to the judge for fully understanding the theory and then doing his own weighing of the evidence. So I think he did all that appropriately because the process was good. I don't know about the conclusion, but the process was surely good. Uh, in the 1990 guidelines, Joe, information as the perspective totally underlies the 1990, a long time ago, perspective on uh, coordinated effects. It's all about information, um, in part thanks to the prior work of Joe Stiglitz and others. So policy staying abreast of new economics. Unilateral effects in the guidelines, and certainly in 2010 as well, based on game theory, based on Nash equilibrium and how that would be disturbed, altered because of merger effects. Relevant markets in the old guidelines being based on price discrimination. Uh, this is not new to antitrust policy. Antitrust policy tends to keep up with economics as far as I can see it. So I'm disputing Joe's point of view on that. Uh, many more modules, but one more. Uh, Joe said, and I'm quoting, that anti-competitive practices should be presumed illegal unless there's strong cognizable efficiencies. He didn't use the word cognizable. You know what he meant. Uh, cognizable is important, but how does jo Joe think that he knows, or administrative processes know, what is anti-competitive without a holistic analysis of the effects of the conduct? This will be a theme that we'll come back to, but it seems to me that the Supreme Court in Amex, for example, got right that there's lots of situations where the assessment of anti-competitiveness has to be holistic, called a two-sided or an end-sided market. I don't know, but this is not a fresh thought. We've been doing this for a long time with the approval of the community when it comes to RPM, when it comes to exclusive territories, when it comes to Kodak concerns about the aftermarket, holistic effects, and if you read the court in sort of a pleasant mood, that's what they're urging when it comes to two-sided markets as well. So I'll leave it at that for now, but thanks. Okay, thank, thanks very much. Uh, you've heard the responses to questions in, from the first panel. I'd like to briefly touch again on uh, consumer welfare standard, which has been uh, discussed in various matters is it makes sense to talk about the consumer welfare standard as the dominant uh, guiding lodestar for U.S. antitrust? Anybody have any additional things to add to what's already been said? So, Mike? I guess uh, I will sort of, in some sense, maybe question the, the, the premise, which is sometimes I think this debate over the consumer welfare standard obscures larger issues. And part of that's because the more I hear it talked about, the less I know what it means. Are we talking about the way Judge Bork said it, the way Judge Posner, the way Professor Hovenkamp, and this matters. And so then people are talking at crossed winds. Are we talking about how the consumer welfare standard in theory is used or how it applies in practice in cases? Those are two very different questions. And so I kind of go back to the way I, so I do, I think a better question is where, what, where I started, which is how do we decide whether or not the antitrust laws are affecting competition? Because the one thing I think the antitrust laws, when, and when properly defined and interpreted, they're good at stopping the, un, the unjustified accumulation or abuse of monopoly power. And I think that question is, is, is focused and can be answered. And I think the evidence weighs heavily that the answer is no. But I do want to end with one part about the consumer welfare standards. Also, I think it also leads to confusion. So there's a big debate right now. Do If you have a merger, for example, that creates monopsony power and lowers wages, is that covered by the consumer welfare standard? And people like argue over this. I think the answer should be absolutely. You're creating market power and, and reducing competition and creating deadweight loss. I don't understand how that is not encompassed by the, the antitrust laws. 
But the very fact that we've spent 40 years talking about the consumer welfare standard means for a long time people like me, maybe I'm a group of one, that's what we, we just sort of thought about consumers. And so back in 2008 or 2009, Peter Carstensen came into my office when I was an attorney advisor and he tried to tell me about the problems about buyer power, about labor monopsony. And you know what? He was right and I should have listened to him and I didn't. Because I think the, and, part, and, the, and I think it's important as part of these the proceedings, which is something Commissioner Slaughter talked about, is an honest self-assessment, particularly for those of us who are in government, of what we did right and what we did wrong. But so, you know, so the, the, I'll sort of just leave it there. But uh, you know, I, I, but I do sort of that consumer welfare standard. I think that debate actually obfuscates the real issues often more than enlightens and illuminates them. Alden, yes, Bobby. Yo, thank you. Uh, I'm a little confused about that phrase. I mean, consumer welfare is a, a good pair of words. And to me, if it means neglecting monopsony issues and worker welfare in labor markets, then it's a misnomer because it's the wrong term then. Uh, in, I think, both sets of guidelines, 1990, 2010, there's a small paragraph that says, all of the analysis in these guidelines, which is written as if it's about the product market side, should be applied as well to the buyer side when it comes to monopsony power. So at least in the guidelines, there is the right respect shown for worrying about mergers' effects on buy side markets. And I would like to see the phrase consumer welfare be extended to the other side of the market with, with the same full force. And if it doesn't do that, then I agree with those who think there's a failure of embracing the consumer welfare standard too narrowly. On the other hand, if consumer welfare and worker welfare mean let's not pay attention to the accretion of more jobs as a good thing because the economy needs more jobs, well, then I applaud holding us to a consumer welfare and worker welfare standard because I think that is a misuse of antitrust, a misuse of economic policy. If it means let's not pay attention to political influence and in doing merger analysis, I applaud that as well. Let's stick to the welfare standard. If it means worrying about inequality, well, more about that later. But monopsony definitely is an appropriate challenge to equality because the inequality that results from monopsony power is the bad kind of inequality holding people down instead of the good side applauding it when people enrich themselves by providing better products and better productivity. So I'm confused about the term, but those are my feelings about it. So interesting, a, an observation, and I've heard it from others as well, I think the, the term consumer welfare standard may m mean different things to different people and perhaps therefore uh, is not terribly helpful to the debate. Does anybody have any final thoughts on that? Uh, Alden? Yes, Bill? Uh, I think if you took from Bobby's comment, you would have a good set of specifications that I think clarify what a very useful definition of the term would mean. And your emphasis, Bobby, on how concerns about monopsony have indeed featured in earlier policy guidance. Uh, they, are, they are there, along with the cautions about what a notion of worker welfare might mean if you included it to protect and freeze in place all employment possibilities that exist now and shield them from uh, changes that might take place in the face of a merger. As you know, one discussion today about taking on worker welfare and employment effects uh, suggests that that should be front and center a consideration in a whole range of cases. Uh, I mean, here's an argument that's made in a common cartel case. Small, relatively small businesses they get together to rotate bids or to set output levels. And a defense that they would raise would be, we are trying to make sure that all of our small businesses can stay in business. Mm. And that there is a relatively even flow of work across the span of the sector. And who are we doing it for? We're doing it for our workers. At this point, in a DOJ criminal case, that defense would be stricken as irrelevant. And the Supreme Court has said a number of times, we don't take that into account. If you took on that argument, you'd fundamentally change the examination of cartel cases. You would change the prohibition on cartels to take into account defenses based, for example, on employment effects. Uh, 
uh, or other effects as well. I'd, I'd add to, to, to Bobby's list, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, an emphasis of what's dropped out of sight. And that is the larger concern about SMEs as an end in itself. Uh, and the way since the 1970s, the Supreme Court has abandoned the language of egalitarian antitrust as expressed perhaps best in, in Alcoa. Uh, imagine how the American Express case might have been litigated differently. Dennis puts in his testimony, his, coll his colleagues advance all of the efficiency arguments related to the transaction, and the department stands up and says, Judge Leon, I want you to read the last page of the Brown Shoe merger decision from 1962. Here it is, where the court acknowledges that there can be real benefits economically from vertical integration and vertical mergers. And the court says, we acknowledge those. Then comes the famous phrase, but we cannot overlook the clear intent that Congress had in 1950 to preserve a more egalitarian business environment and at the cost of some efficiencies to disregard the benefits that we've just described. The department might have stood up and said, Your Honor, we want all of the efficiency arguments stricken. Brown shoe is still binding. The Supreme Court has never repudiated this in a merger case. Maybe its point of view has been questioned, but if the department wanted to go all in to prevail in the case, they might have said, we bring you back to what the Supreme Court had to say about efficiencies as a defense and about the preservation of other values. All of this discussion about efficiencies is beside the point. And as a matter of jurisprudence, that wouldn't have been a crazy argument to make. It would have repudiated a lot of government policy making sense, but the bare terms of the text are right there and the DOJ could have said, I just want to remind you in the hierarchy of authority in the United States, the Supreme Court is at the top of the pyramid. You, Mr. USDJ, you're at the bottom. You're obliged to follow them. Would Brown Shoe have knocked out all of that evidence? That view of the aims of the antitrust laws has changed dramatically. Alden, can, yes. I just, can I just add one comment on the consumer welfare standard? So the reason why we're up here talking about consumer welfare and we've, uh, the community has been entrenched in discussing consumer welfare for the last two or three years is because there were some very public statements made early on that consumer welfare only goes to price effects. That's just wrong. It's wrong. It's a misinterpretation or a misunderstanding of what the standard does. The standard is actually quite flexible and, and appropriate in many cases. Um, it goes to price effects, non-price effects, quality, variety. It could go to choice. It could go to innovation. It can be applied at any market, anywhere in a supply chain, an output market, an input market, a labor market. It can address a, a, a great deal of scope along the supply chain and depth within markets in terms of price and non-price dimensions of competition. The problem is this, that the consumer welfare standard has been, has been in, interpreted in a, in a cramped way in many cases, um, and it has also been uh, interpreted in a very static way, which goes to my earlier point about the need to consider more dynamic effects using a consumer welfare standard and looking at the, the effects of successive mergers and creating concentration and harming consumers over a longer period of time. And there are a lot of other examples that go to the dynamic use of the standard as opposed to the static use. Uh, let, let's. Uh, Thanks for that. Let's jump forward to the issue of uh, presumptions. On the last panel, we talked a little bit about this issue of structured presumptions, the limits of antitrust, and, uh, and structured rules. We have on the panel today someone who's as long experience as a practitioner and as an enforcer uh, at uh, the FTC. Perhaps uh, uh, Debbie Feinstein, do you have any thoughts on presumptions? Sure, and I, I think it covers some of the issues that we have been talking about. Um, you know, is there a presumption that vertical transactions are, are pro-competitive? Uh, you know, in the sense that there's certainly a recognition that there can be efficiencies from them, it's something that people look at. But when we come to any particular vertical transaction, when I was at the agency, there wasn't a presumption that it was pro-competitive and we had to overcome that presumption in order to bring a case. It was, look, lots of vertical transactions are uh, unproblematic. 
that's fine. We're not looking at lots of them. We're looking at the one before us, and we're going to look very hard at whether or not uh, this is actually pro-competitive. Um, you know, Diana said, you know, should there be a rule that we require parties to prove up their efficiencies? There is a rule that we require parties to prove up their efficiencies. The agencies are, you know, look very, very hard at that uh, issue. And when you look at how the courts have treated it, the courts have totally bought into the notion that efficiencies better be real in merger cases and they better be passed on. So that the notion that we're somehow missing that uh, uh, it just sort of puzzles me. Hey, Debbie, um, can I just interrupt for a sec? That I want to clarify that when I say prove up efficiencies, I don't mean in the merger investigation context. I mean when the companies consummate their deal, then they can prove up their claimed efficiencies that they actually materialized in their in their business practices. That that was what I meant. Yeah, and that's something that we do by looking at, you know, the next transaction. I mean, that's a, a, a you know, another point to be made is uh, I am all for merger retrospectives. The agencies do many merger retrospectives all the time just in the course of their business uh, of their work. So I, I can think of an example of a particularly um, controversial case that occurred before I got there. I'm not going to say which one. There was um, a lot of consternation about whether or not the merger should have been challenged, and there were um, a mix of opinions on it. Fast forward to the time I got to the agency, and the same industry was before us, and we were very prepared to hear that we had gotten it wrong last time. And we're talking about, okay, if we hear that we've gotten it wrong last time, what are we going to do about it? Are we, you know, going to go back and, and challenge that? What are we going to do not only about the case before us, but the case that we had? And what we heard is customer after customer saying, you know, we told you we thought that it was going to be good for us. It's been better for us than we thought it was going to be. Mm. Um, shocked us. We didn't expect that. And they said, and we can show you. Let us show you what our contracts and our terms looked like beforehand and what they look like now. Uh, and we learned that, okay, we had gotten it right. Um, at a time when I wasn't there, they had gotten it right beforehand. So the notion that, that the agency isn't reflective or isn't able to figure out whether or not efficiencies are occurring, whether or not past transactions are a problem, doesn't mean that they get it right every time, but it does go to this notion of is there this um, constant um, learning. Finally, one other point just to weigh in on the uh, consumer welfare standard uh, and the worker welfare standard. Um, that's, you know, worker welfare is one issue that arises out of monopsony, but there are lots of others that are counter to at least short-term consumer welfare, right? Because there are lots of monopsony problems where it's a wealth transfer. It doesn't affect the output. And, um, uh, you know, to block something like that might lead to not having a pass down of, of price, prices that would go to consumers. Is that a problem? Is that not a problem? Um, is an issue worth discussing? But the notion that monopsony is only about worker effects on monopsony isn't right, and you have to think about um, all of monopsony if you're going to incorporate all of that into the, the consumer welfare standard. Uh, Bill, any thoughts on, on presumptions? I, I echo Debbie's observations about how actively over time I see the agencies working to shape those in the right way. Um, I go back to Bobby's observation about merger guidelines. Uh, in many ways, merger guidelines have been a soft law device to change presumptions. And you see the dramatic change over time in the way in which those have been cast. Uh, in their own way, 1982, then again in 1992, uh, 2010 each, a major adjustment in the way in which things were formulated. Uh, and that, ref that, that, that reflects to me a, a, a constant effort to upgrade the existing product by taking on new theories, new learning, but to provide a very manageable framework in, in which it can be applied. And I'd say the broad adoption and emulation of that document, those documents over time, is a testament globally uh, to how well the agencies have done that. I, I can think of other areas in which uh, the same kind of reflection and adjustment has taken place. California Dental put a big hole in the framework of the rule of reason. That was a serious setback. What was the institutional response at the FTC to reclaim that ground? How? Uh, by choosing cases and thinking about cases as vehicles for moving the boundaries that have been set. 
The first vehicle was Polygram, a second parallel vehicle was Shearing, the third vehicle was RealComp. Uh, when you take the amalgam of those over time, you have a formula for, call it the quick look, uh, call it inherently suspect. You have a way for ordering the examination of evidence and data that allows you to sort out behavior that arguably has detrimental effects and condemn it without looking at the universe and all it contains. So I think the agencies have been attuned to doing that. I would underscore though that it doesn't happen simply by accident. And if there are areas in which you want to move the boundaries, the stakes of the law to take account of existing doctrine or to incorporate new thoughts, that has to be a program of conscious effort where you sit down and ask, where would we like to move the fence? How do we do it? That should be a common conversation between at least the department and the commission to decide what those boundaries are and to think about choosing cases that enable you to do it. Uh, in short, it has to be a conscious process of evolution uh, and change, very conscious in guidelines, very conscious in a number of routine merger decisions, certainly conscious in the case of, of polygram shearing and, and real comp. It doesn't happen by accident, and it starts by thinking out where you think you have to make adjustments and looking for the specific instances in which you can do that. Uh, Mike, uh, do you have anything to add on presumptions? So uh, I think it's important to sort of distinguish agency practice and, and where the law is. So I entirely agree with both what Bill and Debbie are saying and, and about, and I think Dennis said it last time about the importance of the agency pushing back on rules and doing studies, trying to develop uh, the, the right rules. At the same time, it's important to acknowledge the three cases Bill just mentioned were three cases that should have been easy to decide. There wasn't a real deficiency defense. There was, in Shearing, there was not a market power defense. There was not, and yet, let's take Shearing, and as disclosure, I worked on Shearing. And you I worked on Shearing. Lots of pay for delay cases, right? When the commission lost that at the Court of Appeals, it set off eight years where the predominant legal rule was that a patent holder in a pharmaceutical case can basically pay as much money as it wants to its generic competitor as long as they agree to stay off no longer than the patent expires. For eight years, the commission had to, to spend massive resources to convince the judiciary that that should not be per se legal. In that time period, there were hundreds of those settlements. Conservatively, the cost of those settlements probably were in the range of 30 to $50 billion to consumers. Finally, in the th 2013, when it got before Justice Breyer, he was like, I don't understand. How is this so complicated? And he writes a decision and says, no, they, the rule of reason applies. What's happened since then? There were all these concerns beforehand that if you had a too stringent rule, settlements would go away. Generic companies would be afraid to even challenge patents, and brand companies would stop doing R&D. This is all the sort of standard, Frank Easterbrook, we are concerned about over-enforcement, not about under-enforcement. And what did we see post-activists? The number of patent settlements in the two years afterwards, records both years. The number of paragraph four filings has, generics challenging patents, has continued to go up. And this one I have not researched thoroughly, but I'm pretty confident no branded company has made a public statement to its investors that we have reduced in, in, in R&D because the Supreme Court and activists took away our right to pay off our potential competitors. So the very, so the reason we have a 10 year battle with massive harm because we underestimated how bad the false negative would be, how bad under enforcement would be, and overestimated how bad over enforcement would be. And that's where I see the problem with antitrust law today, that the courts systematically make that decision wrong. And yes, the agency does a great job pushing back, but that is expensive, and those are resources once used, can't be used anywhere else. Okay, very interesting. Let's, uh, let's move on to the question of rules, competition rules, which, as we mentioned in the first panel, uh, has been raised by Commissioner
Chopra, uh, one interesting issue somebody from the audience raised is this issue of so-called Chevron deference, judicial deference to uh, agency interpretations of statutory ambiguities, which may be on the way out. Uh, don't know whether or how important that really is to the question, but does, do our panelists have any thoughts on competition rules? And uh, let's start uh, with uh, uh, Diana. Thanks, Alden. Um, so I, I think the jury is a little bit out on the um, advisability or the tractability of using um, rulemakings, FTC rulemakings, to advance um, uh, or codify rules that would bear directly on various competitive issues. Um, uh, I, I think one question is how uh, could they even be done at the FTC level? I'm a former federal regulator and probably went through three or four or five major rulemakings at the FERC in a really short period of time. They are massive efforts. And, um, and then the industry needs a lot of guidance on how those rulemakings should be uh, interpreted, what, what's guidance, what's not guidance. Uh, and it creates, um, it creates an administrative administrability problem, as Bill Kovacic uh, uh, likes to say. Um, I think there are other ways, and I'm going to agree with Dennis Carlton here, on how the agencies can um, help shape and guide um, uh, enforcement and provide um, transparency and input to the community. And that would be to use to the full extent of their uh, ability and their authority to conduct market studies. The FTC certainly can do um, stuff like that. Uh, to uh, do merger retrospectives um, where um, they study not only merger outcomes, but also the effects of remedies and the effectiveness of remedies. The FTC already does that. They've now done two studies on their divestiture remedies. Um, this is really important information that we're now in a position to, to really uh, cull and consider when it comes to looking at the effectiveness of antitrust um, enforcement, particularly merger enforcement, um, looking, looking back. Um, I also think, as a more, as a more dramatic proposal, um, whether, and I like Bill's idea, I'm going to agree with Bill Kovacic now, that um, having the ability to do market analysis and an agency to take actions to address market, um, market distortions uh, that arise from anti-competitive conduct uh, where there are systematic problems or systemic problems, that's not a, that is worth considering, absolutely worth considering. And as Bill pointed out, there are a number of other jurisdictions who, who have this authority and who have significant authority under those, under those uh, 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 regimes to actually affect how markets are structured and how conduct in those markets occurred. So, you know, one thing the FTC might want to do is put out an NOI or, or a, a, a query on what people think about doing rulemakings. Uh, I think there would be really important input from the, from the antitrust community um, on the pros and the cons, and the, but more important, the effectiveness of rulemakings. Uh, and how rulemakings would, fa would, would, um, would factor in to the enforcement process. Uh, Bill Kovacic is a law professor. How do you think an appeals court might react to some rule interpreting unfair methods of competition and applying it to a particular practice? Uh, I think in practice, Chevron deference is a mirage. Uh, I think that you get the deference you earn and that if you plan on tipping the court by walking in simply by saying, we enjoy what the Europeans would call the margin of discretion, you're delusional. Uh, my view is that courts defer when they are persuaded that deferring is a good idea. So I would never bet a program on enjoying that element of, of uh, the benefit of the doubt. How do you get them to agree? I think two ways. One is you do have to marshal evidence to support whatever your initiative is, be it a rule if you do that, and the FTC has defended countless rules before the courts on the consumer protection side. Um, or you have to create a brand that is convincing to them. I am convinced that agencies have reputations. They do have brands. In part, what they're doing when they go in is saying, 
on matters of doubt or uncertainty, we are the experts, and the expertise is not imaginary or hypothetical, it is genuine. And how do you build that brand and that image so that when you walk into the courtroom, there's a halo above your head before you say a word, it's doing all of the other things and using all of the other policy tools we've been talking about. It's doing empirical work. So you put it before the court and say, um, much more than you, we've looked at this. We've done the kind of work that Michael and his colleagues uh, helped do on, on generics that helped turn the tide a bit by gathering information and publishing data on what was happening uh, with uh, individual settlements. Um, you hold and convene events like this where you ask the larger world, educate us about what's going on, you reflect on it, you publish articles, papers, you give speeches. I think every time the agency, a member of the board goes to speak or a bureau director, you have to realize that you are either elevating or depressing the stock of the agency. Everything you do shapes the impression, especially in this city with the court that we appear before here, here, they form impressions of the agency on bases that go well beyond the appearance in specific cases. So if you build that brand and that reputation and you support the individual initiatives that you're working on with significant evidence, I think you can persuade even a significant group of intervention skeptics, of regulatory skeptics, that you do indeed have the benefit of the doubt. But again, that is not an accidental or spontaneous process. That requires a conscious commitment by the institution to pick the matter, be it a rule or a case, that you think is a good vehicle to proceed with, to think, have we built the surrounding supporting evidence to, to, to gain support? And are we doing things day in and day out that, that raise the brand and create a reputation for capacity uh, and knowledge? I think in a lot of ways, uh, my experience here at the FTC, the FTC has done that. But I think to go ahead and take on more difficult challenges, if you wanted to set presumptions with respect to when a dominant enterprise can buy a promising new startup, and you want to go beyond looking at the records and files of the company, if you want to create such a presumption, there the court's going to say, you have the power to do it. What's your evidence? And what evidence will we put on the table to do that? And that will be the big challenge. So, uh, and you might want to start with a smaller prototype matter rather than the rule that changes the universe and everything it contains to show that you can do it because the FTC arguably has never done it. Yeah, Anybody I have just, anything to add on rulemaking? Yeah, I just think that's the, what Bill's saying is the, the cart horse issue, right? Commission could have done a rulemaking on uh, reverse patent settlements. I know there was discussion within the building of doing it, not when I was there, but because people in the building asked me what I thought. Um, and you have to pick the right time to do it. You have to have had enough experience, enough empirical studies, and enough examples where you've studied them, but not so many that you've already gone to the Supreme Court and you're basically in a situation where you're overturning the Supreme Court decision by rulemaking because I don't think that would be well received. So it's intriguing in principle how you would ever actually do it because you have to have looked at a number of cases and you've either brought those cases and won them, in which case, why do you need a rulemaking? Because you're obviously having good success. Or you've lost those cases, and if you're losing the case on the facts, how are you going to convince the court on the facts that they ought to abide by your rulemaking? So I just see a practical issue that it's hard for me to figure out how you overcome. Mm. I would like to vote in favor of not rulemakings now, but more guidelines in the areas of conduct. Exclusionary conduct, two-sided markets, n-sided markets, Section two, section five conduct generally. I think the economic profession is ready to contribute to that. I think the, the I.O. field is ready because we have a plethora of, of interesting theories and we've gone part way toward looking for empirical evidence, signs that uh, an exercise of intervention is needed or is not needed. And it's a tough job, but it's the job that I think we might all be ready to do. And it's necessary for business guidance. It's a good idea for staff guidance. It's a good idea to elevate the credibility of the agencies in this very murky area. 
and I think it is a murky area still. Uh, I th I'd say amen to that. Yep. Uh, that is, uh, uh, you look at the tremendous soft law influence that merger guidelines have had, I think you can replicate that in other areas. It happened with the 1995 DOJ FTC intellectual property guidelines. Absolutely. Uh, there's an obvious feedback effect into the courts. Again, even courts that are skeptics about intervention but are faced with hard problems are interested in proposed solutions. They have no obligation, of course, to take on the solutions suggested or the framework suggested in the guidelines, uh, but you can look at a number of significant areas where that would be useful. Uh, the agencies tried it with uh, competitor coordination, made some progress, but there was some sensitivity about saying too much about matters uh, that, were, that, were, that were in the courts, so yeah. they, they hesitated. Uh, but, uh, but you could imagine a number of areas where I think guidelines as, as a, a form of soft rulemaking uh, mm -hmm. can have tremendous, tremendous effect and to sit down and decide where could we make the most impact in doing and that. And interagency so, cooperation as you were speaking for yeah. before, Bill. So I just wanted to sort of maybe echo a little bit what both Bill and, and Debbie were saying. I mean, in some sense, the answer to your, the question is utilitarian. And it, it, do you, is there a rule out there that the FTC can do that is better than the enforcement option? And I think it's important to remember that the, in rulemaking, the FTC is going to have a lot of discretion. It's not just what they can ban things. They can set burdens of proof. They can set presumptions. Does that rule have the right evidentiary basis that's going to be persuasive? And here the FTC has the ability to do a 6B study if that, to enforce that. But in, are there going to be risks? Yes. But as someone who you know, spent a long time litigating antitrust cases, those have big risks too. And maybe, when, you know, and therefore it's not a good enough reason to sort of abandon, not consider a tool just because there will be risks. I'll give you my example of a missed opportunity to do this with respect to conduct, and that was resale price maintenance. Legion takes place. Legion says that there are instances in which vertical restraints, resale price maintenance could be harmful. We started an initial effort internally to, to say, can't the Federal Trade Commission elaborate this? That is, might there be a place here to do some guidelines? We had a set of hearings, a limited set of hearings, and then the thought was, can we draft guidelines, our guidelines about how the Legion screens and the Legion factors might be applied going ahead? Uh, sadly, disappointingly, uh, that fell through the cracks. Uh, that did not m galvanize the interests of, uh, of, the, of the entire board uh, to proceed with that. Uh, but if you, th if you thought for a moment, who might be good to provide that elaboration? Uh, that's, that would ideally, I think, would have been the Federal Trade Commission uh, to do that. So, and, and thus, what have the two federal agencies done in the field of resale price maintenance since Legion, which was a while ago? Chris Varney issued a speech when she was at the Department of Justice in her first year, and the FTC issued an order modification approval in Nine West, an RPM case. Otherwise, nothing. That's an area where the agency might have gone ahead with guidelines, might have thought, let's bring the vertical restraints case that tests what, what Legion should mean. Instead, there's been nothing there. Now, I realize that RPM is not, is certainly by the, the discussion that we've had today and, and, and perhaps before, does not seem to be the salient issue that's uh, firing the imagination of the, the larger competition community. But it is stunning that since Legion, that has been the sum of the response of the two agencies. That is an area where the FTC and DOJ could have said, what do we think the high ground is for RPM? and where might we go looking, go looking for cases? I have a slide that, that does that. Pardon? I'll send it to you. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think uh, unless anyone has something to add, first panel, we discussed Amex briefly. There, there did not seem to be any support for the majority opinion in Amex. Mm. Uh, does anyone want to support the majority opinion in Amex? I do. Uh, my support for the decision is a support for the idea of, and I just came to this word preparing for this, holistic analysis. So we've got lots of different practices, vertical practices, and I think the Amex practice is broadly in that category. 
<clears throat> and some element of that practice appears superficially to be anti-competitive or non-competitive, like anti-steering that cuts off one form of competition at the cash register. Uh, think about an RPM that cuts off a certain form of competition. Think about territorial exclusives, that those had their day in terms of debate. They do eliminate some forms of competition. There's endless varieties of vertical restraints that have some elements of curtailing competition, which also have well-known positive effects on the entire ability of that brand or of that offering to be competitive in the broader marketplace. And we're used to that in a lot of domains. And uh, reading the Supreme Court decision, I wouldn't have written it quite that way, and our guidelines wouldn't write it exactly that way. And I wouldn't put quite so much emphasis on the two-sided nature uh, of the market, because I agree that that's an easy slogan to throw around. But in my ideal guidelines, I would say the thing that makes a two-sided market something that must be taken into account is that the good side and the bad side are inextricably linked. And we talked about that in terms of merger guidelines and efficiencies. If it is the finding of the agency or of the court that the good and the bad really have to go together, and you can't have the good without the bad, then the requisite analysis is holistic. And we shouldn't be very quick to say, oh, I see a bad thing about this, and then the burden shifts to the other side to point out the good. I think it's the agency's responsibility and the court's responsibility to take a holistic view of the practice, good and bad. And with a smile on my face, I would say a pleasant interpretation of the Amex decision is a push in that direction. So, Mike? I mean, the, 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 I'm glad uh, sort of Bobby spoke up here because I think the, this is exactly what's gone wrong with the antitrust laws. Let's be clear on where the Supreme Court came down. They came down in saying the government failed to prove market power because they didn't do the entire analysis, including showing an output effect. My question is, when the government had, had proved all that, what would be left to the antitrust, what defense is left? If they had proved both that prices went up and output went down, what's left to that case? But apparently the Supreme Court thinks there's still something that the defendants could raise. Second, American Express, through its non-steering, restricted no merchants accounting for 90% of all credit card transactions from engaged in steering, and the Supreme Court, at the end of the day, said, we don't really think that's a market effect. Because that's what your market power determination is. So we can argue about whether their steering provision was good or bad. American Express didn't want to argue about that because they knew they were going to lose. So they found a way to argue a failure to prove mar monopoly power. And I think anyone who is not deeply versed in complicated economics and an antitrust technocrat looks at, would look at that decision and say, that's wrong. This is not a case about whether American Express was able to eliminate a form of competition from the marketplace. Check, it did that. It's about whether that type of restraint should be allowed or not. Can I, can I just add to what Michael is saying? And, and one observation from Amex is that it really, um, uh, in the worst form creates a new, a new rule for when to consider a two-sided market in an, in an antitrust case. And I mean, this, this doesn't go, this doesn't uh, negate the possibility that in fact we have two-sided markets in many instances, but the, the opinion sets up an impossibly vague uh, um, test, which is, well, we'll consider two-sided markets when the tipping effects are strong. And we'll consider one-sided markets when the tipping effects are weak. Those are the kinds of rules that um, are almost impossible for antitrust enforcers and courts to, uh, to, um, uh, to, to investigate, to adjudicate, and to come to some sort of consistent outcome. And that's what, that's what uh, uh, the courts are all about, is creating some sort of consistent outcome. So the economists, I think, are going to have to do a lot of work figuring out, well, What's a strong tipping effect and what's a weak tipping effect? Particularly in the context uh, of creating the assumption or the presumption that it's a, uh, it's, it should be defined as a two-sided market versus a one-sided market. Th this, has not done an this decision has not done antitrust any good, any good whatsoever, other than acknowledging the fact that in some industries uh, we have two-sided markets, and eventually antitrust will have to deal with that. But given that, uh, that vagueness and impossibility of applying that rule, 
uh, without creating a whole other set of debates. I don't think am the, the extendability or the portability of the Amex outcome to other two-sided market cases is going to go very far. Anyone else? Okay, let's jump now to IPN, I trust. We've already heard a little bit on pay for delay, but there are obviously other issues which were raised at first panel, the so-called standard essential patent issues about refusals to license or uh, alleged holdups, but there are other issues as well, including uh, mergers and contracts in high technology markets, which may involve uh, uh, intangible intellectual property. And uh, does anybody have any general comments as to whether the state of antitrust law right now is dealing uh, more or less well or adequately with uh, the challenges of intellectual property transactions or are changes needed? Uh, and if changes are needed in what specific uh, areas? Uh, what about uh, Bobby? Thanks. So I have a peculiar idea, and this is a great forum to air it. The whole pay for delay area, which as we've all said is very complicated and hasn't been handled very well by the community. And if you read activists talk about criteria that don't really exist in terms of administrability, large payments, what the heck does that mean? The idea that I have is that most of those cases start with patent litigation. So there's a court that's involved in resolving the patent issues, then there's a settlement of that case with lots of side effects. Why shouldn't there be a public interest standard for that settlement that the court that's adjudicating the patent litigation should have to look at the settlement and decide whether that settlement is in the public interest or not? And there could be open hearings on that question, and the FTC could spend whatever time it, it chooses to. Uh, taking a position on that, and the parties could take a position on that, but why not adjudicate that in the same court that was hearing the patent litigation? Because uh, you might think that that judge already has a sense about the facts surrounding the dispute and the strength of the patent and so forth. So I just wanted to throw that out when they have FTC people around here. Uh, on the SEP issues, uh, I was really interested in hearing Dennis on this this morning. He was saying he'd like to see more of those disputes settled at the level of the SSO, the standard setting organization. And that's an appealing idea to me, uh, except that I know that the SSOs are populated when they're working well by all sides of the market, users as well as producers of the technology. Uh, and it's hard to see how the SSO could wind up in the adjudicative role when it comes to whether or not the SEP is performing up to the standards. But I would like to see the SSOs take a more detailed look at what FRAND means to them in their context and actually be pushed to lay out those criteria in a more complete way. I've seen some SSOs do that and others just say, oh, well, FRAND is the solution without having any idea what that means. And I personally would like to see FRAND standards take more recognition of the absence of the applicability of sort of a commodity market to the idea of the way royalties and prices ought to work and to take more account of the idea that, look, this is all about recovering or the prospect of recovering the fixed cost of the R&D. And so what we mean by discrimination or non-discrimination should take the need for differential pricing into account, nonlinear pricing, in ways that are more sophisticated and more attuned to the economics of those kinds of markets. And I'd like to see the SSOs take that on before we get to the role of the antitrust agencies, which should not be cut off but I'd like to see the SSOs take a stab at it first. Mike, any reaction? Um, I agree with everything Bobby said on pay for delay. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, first of all, I don't think I said, and I don't think people at the FTC think pay for delay is all that complicated. In fact, when you come across any anti-competitive activity, the modeling is very strong that the incentives will always drive to anti-competitive results. So two, I don't think people agree. I don't agree that activists is that hard to understand, and I think the proof's in the pudding. Like I said, activists occurred, the number of settlements went up dramatically, but the number of pay, potential pay for delay settlements within the next few years dropped dramatically, and I think part of that is due to the Supreme Court, and I think part of that's due to the, the, this very this strong settlement that the FTC got in the Cephalon case, where 
then went back in and we see God disgorgement and sent a signal that engaging in this kind of con activity is going to be unprofitable. I don't think it's the role of the FTC to have to police every single patent settlement. And I would like just to add on this point, I mean, I've heard a lot about the FTC should be doing lots of studies, should be apparently judging every single patent settlement in court. Are we planning to increase the FTC's budget by 100-fold? I mean, right, part of the issue is every time when someone says the FTC needs to study an issue more, where is those resources coming from? And then finally, just on innovation, I just want to add, one of the things I think that gets missed in the innovation debate is that competition can drive innovation. And so I think it's interesting, right now, maybe right now or today, at the Searle Conference, the big industrial organization conference in Northwestern, one of the papers being discussed is a paper called Killer Acquisitions. Fascinating paper that seems to suggest that pharmaceutical companies are consistently buying potential competitors and shelving in innovation. And that suggests that maybe there's another whole area of merger enforcement that we need to be much more concerned about. But I have to say, again, the courts, that's not the kind of theory I think a court's going to be particularly attracted to. And so we'll probably have to go through the, the, what Bill Kovacic says, is year, decades, uh, a decade of studying it and spending lots of time. And maybe by the time I retire, then somebody else can be explaining how that battle was, was worthy but shouldn't have taken so long. Can I, can I just add one more thing on, yes. on this issue? Um, I do a lot of work in agricultural biotechnology. And um, what we're seeing in ag biotech with patented uh, uh, transgenic seed, crop seed, is a lot of what, we're, of what we saw in pharma um, with uh, patenting second generation drugs or second generation seed in this case, making very minor modifications to the product, repatenting it, and then forcing consumers uh, in the case of seed farmers, uh, onto the new product, the newly patented product. So wh whether you call it product hopping, hard switches, soft switches, um, it's raising a really serious uh, background issue in patent, uh, in, in the patent system. And uh, I think calls for a serious relook at how patents are issued and, and potentially questions for patent reform. But this is one area, because of the very important close intersection between IP and competition law uh, and how patents can be used to shape or control competition to exclude rivals, particularly new entrants, um, I am stunned in talking on conferences and with people at how little the antitrust community is conversant with patent law, and conversely, how inconversant the patent community is about antitrust law. And so there needs to be some effort, and I think the FTC is a great venue for doing this, of bringing those two groups together because it's part of a multi-tool toolkit where you've got antitrust and you have patent law, IP law, and these folks need to sit down and talk together about how policies made uh, on the patent side affect, can potentially affect uh, uh, outcomes on, uh, in antitrust enforcement. Alden? Bill, I'd like to follow on uh, Diana's comment. Um, 15 years ago, the FTC had that conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, 15 years ago, the FTC devoted a tremendous amount of effort, along with the Department of Justice, to doing a basic examination of the rights granting process. Uh, it convened proceedings like this, uh, starting in 2000, uh, late in 2001, early 2002, uh, examined testimony and presentations by a large number of, of, of experts in the field. And the, the purpose of the undertaking was to identify root causes. There was a concern that competition law too often, especially in the form of abuse of dominance cases, monopolization cases, was following behind to correct problems that basically originated in the rights granting process. You know, recall Dennis's comment about how the scrutiny and the quality of the rights granting process is essential to the proper functioning of the IP regime. Um, the FTC, the Patent Office as well, and DOJ collectively convened these proceedings. Uh, the FTC ultimately ended up writing the report in 2003 called to promote innovation. And it recommended a host of changes to the rights granting process. A number of them have been taken on. Others have shown up in citations and Supreme Court decisions, which reflect a modification and adjustment of, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the interpretation of the existing patent laws. 
Um, this was a major investment in a couple of good practices, looking at root causes, soliciting this larger range of perspectives, um, and seeing how a tool other than simply antitrust enforcement might be, might be applied. Uh, I hate to offer, especially with Michael's caution, glib recommendations to the FTC about other things you ought to be doing. Uh, but 15 years after this study, it wouldn't be a bad time to come back on this question and ask, uh, are we happy with the way that things have unfolded? Uh, a lot of that expertise already exists in-house. Uh, it's present, it's available. Um, I would add, too, that I'm not sure in the larger community that the FTC gets any credit for that. Mm. That is, how does the community evaluate the performance of the agencies? Well, how many cases did you bring? How many cases? How many, how many cases did you win? How many cases did you bring? This was an effort to achieve the kind of longer, deeper policy results uh, that could not be achieved with a case but will never show up on the score sheet as a litigation event. Uh, this was uh, an effort to move the needle elsewhere. I would suggest that the competition law community is mainly captured by flashy objects called big cases. And this kind of investment in research and development and policy change is not widely respected, but arguably this is where a major investment had to be made. I think it was a great investment at the time. It wouldn't be a bad time to come back on it 15 years later and ask, have things moved in the rights granting process uh, in the way that one hoped uh, that they would. And, and by the way, you know, I, just, just, I think this is an example of how the agencies were really interested in dynamic innovation-related changes going back quite a while ago. Mm. This was a recognition that innovation really matters. Let me uh, jump forward quickly. Another topic considered by the first panel. Uh, did, did you have anything to add, Debbie, or no? I just put it Okay, <laughs> so uh, that was pri uh, privacy, uh, data issues about big data, privacy, uh, data security, data protection, which are being examined under consumer protection law. There's more and more talk in some quarters about applying antitrust law to these issues, particularly involving big platforms. Does antitrust have a role, and if so, how, uh, what roadblocks, if any, exist to applying antitrust truthfully in these areas? Uh, who would like to start? I have a simple perspective on this, too simple, I'm sure. Uh, but it seems to me it's pretty obvious these days that data sets and collections of information are important business assets. Uh, they're special assets, they have consumer protection issues surrounding them, which really ought to be worked by the FTC and others. But in the antitrust context, these are assets, and antitrust has treatments of assets. When we look at combinations, vertical or horizontal, we worry about the use of assets and how they could be used more anti-competitively because of a business combination. And those, so, those same concerns are applicable when those assets are data and collections of information. So I think we should use our regular principles on the antitrust side and be ready to apply them to those particular and peculiar assets. Can, can I, I just back it up one step, bef um, one step be behind what Professor Willig just said, and that is to, to uh, throw out the idea that we, we need to give some more thought to what, um, you know, what tool in the toolkit is, where does the privacy problem really reside? What kind of problem is it? And then what are the tools? If it's a, if it's a multi-tool problem, then we, can, then we can then think about how to deploy antitrust or regulation or other tools to, to address it. So if you think really from, from first principles, privacy could be an economic, uh, it could be a market failure, right? It could be asymmetric information, for example. The platforms have way more information on you through their data collection and processing capabilities using artificial intelligence than, than does the hapless consumer, right? If that's the case, then that may be a call for economic regulation. I'm not saying it is, but it's one frame in which to consider the problem. Another way to think about it is as a social regulation problem, right? We just think of privacy as a basic protection like health and safety, and we want to have basic protections in place to, for, to, to protect consumers, okay? Once we exhaust all those possibilities 
or frame out those possible theories. Then we get to antitrust. Absolutely, um, data can be a an asset. It can be a strategic competitive asset. So we have, to, we have to consider data sets, but more important, it's the value added through data processing capability, I think, is where the real action will be, because data processing capability is where the value add in the supply chain is. And that's where the strategic, uh, that's where a lot of the strategic value is going to be in, in assessing um, the competitive effects around the consolidation of horizontal data sets in a horizontal merger, for example, or vertical. Uh, vertical combinations. Um, so I think we're going to have to step through this bigger analysis of, well, what is the privacy problem? It's likely to be a combination of a regulatory issue, but also an antitrust issue. Um, but given the framework we have in place, I think uh, we have the tools uh, for antitrust to consider data to be an asset in any type of combination or a conduct case, for example, using data to exclude or frustrate rivals from access to the market. Evie, do you have some thoughts? Yeah, just a couple of things. One, I'm not sure why privacy is a competition issue. HIPAA isn't a competition statute. We know how to deal with privacy issues quite well. We can do it through consumer protection. We can do it through statutes. I'm still puzzled. It could be a form of non-price um, competition on which two companies compete and which could be lost. I haven't seen that case yet. Usually the concern is one company is good on privacy, the other company is bad on privacy, and the merger of them, the bad on privacy one might might take over, still don't see how that's a competition issue. That's like saying a merger might defeat my favorite flavor of ice cream, but unless there are entry barriers to companies who do the same thing, because uh, we're assuming that there's not a competition issue that we're dealing with, that it's just companies who do two completely different things, I, I, unless there's some barrier to entry that I'm missing, I, I really struggle to see why that's a competition issue. On big data, I mean, I just don't see the difference between big data and little data in terms of um, most of the competition issues. I can name you half a dozen cases where data was the issue, whether it be a horizontal case or a vertical case. The only thing that might be new is we might now be worried about conglomerate um, issues where companies don't compete, but they both have big stores of data. And to the extent as Dennis said that that might lead to an entry barrier in something, but then it just seems to me we define the market as the data and the company's got a monopoly over a certain kind of data. So I just think the tools are there. We just need to figure out where the cases are that actually require us to take action. But I don't see all, as much new under the sun as other people seem to. Maybe I'm missing something. Alden? Yes, Bill. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Diana and uh, Debbie that the FTC does have all the tools. It's the one major authority that has the, the threefold mandate, the, the privacy mandate, the consumer mandate, and the competition mandate. And I think the challenge really is, as Debbie was just saying, to think what's the right tool. Uh, Diana was talking about this as well, to pick the right one. Uh, I want to underscore something that would be a bad practice and that's to use merger review to leverage concessions that arguably should come through separate privacy-related matters, and there are great temptations to do that. Uh, because merger control gives you leverage. You can't make them wait forever, but they can wait for a while. And while they're there, you can pull out a list and say, by the way, while you're here, I've got some other things I'd like to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. And if you work these out with me, you go through the line faster. If you don't, get back in line with the others. Uh, there can be a real temptation to do that. There's a lot of pressure there has been applied in things like Google DoubleClick, Google AdMob. There was enormous pressure from different advocacy groups to use the merger review as the occasion to impose privacy obligations that arguably would arise under a privacy regime. A real concern I would have about what's taking place in a number of European jurisdictions is they are using leverage to effectuate privacy-related matters. That could change with the GDPR, which relaxes the need to do that because it puts a much more robust enforcement mechanism in place. But to use the fines associated with abusive dominance to say, I want you to make changes or I'll land on you with this, and you ask, well, where are the privacy regulators? What are they doing here? I'd be, I think uh, the, the great benefit for the commission is it has wonderful tools to work in this space, including information gathering and data collection analysis. Uh, the temptation to be resisted is to not be absolutely clear about which tool is being used and why, and not to use merger review, which creates leverage to extract concessions. Uh, if a private firm used leverage like that, we'd be very upset about it. Mm. Anything else? <laughs>
Okay, very quickly, we I think we have 10 minutes left according to my watch, but I'd like to very, very quickly touch on the vertical issue. I think we've heard a bit about that. Is there any support on the panel for vertical merger guidelines or ver new vertical restraints guidelines, as was suggested uh, earlier? Do you think that would help the quality of in antitrust enforcement in that area? I'm all for it. Let's do it. The vertical merger guidelines expiry date passed a long time ago, as long, along with the best if used by date. Uh, uh, it is, uh, it is a, a, a important, valuable, crucial moment to step forward and renovate those guidelines. And I would do the same with, I think a previous speaker mentioned re resale price maintenance. I would do the same there, there too. That was a really good idea. A AAI is actually working on developing model vertical guidelines to the extent we can be helpful to the agencies and stimulate discussion in the, in the community. Um, I would add uh, that any discussion of vertical guidelines, uh, which is very uh, appropriate in the wake of AT&T Time Warner, and we'll see what happens in CBS Aetna, which in my view uh, poses even more serious, uh, it poses the serious vertical concerns. Um, part of any discussion about vertical guidelines, I think, uh, should include a discussion of vertical presumptions, much like we have uh, the structural presumption and horizontal mergers, and uh, actually a more recent support for the structural presumption in denying uh, where the agency's challenging large mergers, Cisco U.S. Foods, Baker Hughes Halliburton, that was abandoned, um, uh, the insurance mergers. So the, instru the structural presumption is back. We'll see what happens in Sprint T-Mobile, but on the vertical side, Part of the, uh, the big question, I think, is the importance of setting the landscape in, uh, in explaining why a vertical merger can be anti-competitive by looking at uh, upstream and downstream market concentration, depending on the theory of harm. So uh, we're seeing extremely concentrated markets in many of the markets in which vertical mergers are occurring. I think it's high time for everyone to start thinking, not only about the guidelines, but about what a structural presumption would look like uh, in a vertical context. Okay, I want to quickly switch gears so, so we get one quick question in from the audience uh, to the whole panel. Do you have any doubt that a naked, that naked wage fixing or no, non-poaching agreements should be per se illegal, even if it's clear that no harmful effects will be passed on to end com consumers? For answer, can you just reread it? Mm. Okay, do you have any doubt? So it's about wage fixing or no poaching agreements, uh, even if there's no effect to, to on consumer welfare. Obviously, there's an effect on, on, on the workers. Should those agreements be uh, per se illegal? I mean, I'll go first. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think the agencies have both shown in the, the current administrations of renew, uh, to be applauded for looking at this issue and pushing cases in this area. Uh, okay, very good. And um, when we have a per se rule, we need a characterization step first, right? Yes. I'm always worried about the in house training. So my employer teaches me a lot about the employer's own practices. I learned a lot about the business. And then I want to go to a competitor and use that same information uh, against my first employer. And presumably that causes problems and that causes all kinds of restraints in my employment contract. And so I'm a little bit worried about just an off-handed approach that says uh, you can't have an employer who constrains the employment opportunities of their employees without worrying about that kind of thing. So maybe that's a characterization issue. That, that would certainly, my presumption would be illegality and with characterization, BMI always gives the defendant an opportunity to advance the plausible, cognizable efficiency justification. So if as these cases are pursued, defendants have them and they come forward with them, BMI will give them a chance to talk about it. Okay, very good. In the last few minutes, uh, let me give each panelist an opportunity to uh, make some comments, add anything to his or her prior comments, or make some general observations. Debbie. Uh, so I'd like to answer the last question that was asked of the last panel, because I think it's the most important one, which is where do we go from here? What should we do? Um, I'd give the FTC um, clearer disgorgement authority. 
uh, it best makes new law when it has the threat of a fine or monetary uh, penalties, because otherwise it's too easy for companies facing a complaint to say, all right, we don't want to go through a lawsuit with the FTC, we give. And I've sat in the room plenty of times where it's like, dang, we really want to keep litigating this because we want to make the law on this uh, issue clear. But when we've gotten all the relief that we can possibly get, that's a very hard thing to do. If the threat of litigation were higher and therefore either we could get more benefit by getting disgorgement or parties would be more uh, inclined to settle, either one of those would have a better deterrent effect, um, enable the, co the commission better to get uh, redress for consumers and or force more cases uh, into court. Um, that, could, that could have some effect and I think it's uh, uh, something worth thinking about. The second thing is resources, resources, and resources. And I think, and I can say this now, I think the Bureau of Competition would have been horrified if they heard me say this when I was the director, but when I was asked once, um, come up with a plan if I gave you another $2 million for the Bureau, uh, I will, said most of it should go to the Bureau of Economics and not to work on individual cases, although it'd be great, the agency needs more economists, but to put a group together that could do more empirical uh, studies using the 6B uh, authority because I thought it was, um, you know, a very important thing to do. Mike? So as, a, as I've been preparing for the, the, this panel and, and reading the, the comments, I keep thinking about this, this movie, um, which is somewhat timely relevant because it's about World War I, which 100th anniversary will be of its ending in a couple months, called Paths of Glory. Right? And so this movie sort of takes place in two places. You have the French, this French Italian infantry battalion on the front lines. They've been there forever. They charge up over the hill. They, get, they all die. Then they get reinforcements and they do it again. And that's what they're fighting this whole, their whole life is about these five, six square feet of, of no man's land. And at the end of the movie, Kirk Douglas, so it's a great movie, it's, go see it. Um, he goes to Paris to plead for his troops and he gets to Paris and the French general staff is having this huge ball what you know, sort of classic Belle Epoque. Everybody's happy, everything's fine. And that justice position is something I think that, that I feel is what's going on in antitrust law, that people are bringing up legitimate criticisms and there's a tendency to either say one of two things. One, well, no, 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 antitrust law actually can deal with that problem. Or two, we really need to s study it even more. Hmm. And I think that's a danger. And I think if you look, yes, the guidelines have talked about mergers that harm workers' wages, but until 2010, the agencies never looked at it. And that's not by way of criticizing the agencies, that just means there's learning to be had here. In 2000, the agents, the Congress raised the level of HSR, there's another really important paper that's come out that suggested that the effect of that may have been to spur a bunch of anti-competitive mergers just below the HSR guidelines. And to Bill's point, I think it would have been great if we had done something on RPM. But the problem is we were doing hospitals, we were doing pay for delay, we were doing IP. If we would make the law less lenient towards business conduct, the FTC would be able to do a better job on the more difficult issues. I would like to see the FTC uh, embrace as it has in the past. I, I, I find the, uh, uh, there, there seems to be some notion that there was a golden era of antitrust when it was all great and that concentration was under control. That's a myth. When you look at the criticism recurring from the very beginning, the dominant focus of criticism has been, it has been a failure. So we're not, if we, if we talk about how we're doing now, the question is compared to what? Uh, and compared to what period was it a lot better? Um, I think there are a lot of terribly unrealistic assumptions given uh, the, the experience and the commentary about it, that, that you're gonna have a wildly more robust program than you have now, and it's gonna be wildly more successful than it is when you put the, the experience in context. That said, uh, that's the realism. The ambition is to take the tools that you have and do better, and there are distinctive tools here. As Debbie said, uh, there, there are remedial refinements that could be useful. There's a better way to take the capability to do good research and analysis and bring it to bear on lots of these difficult issues and advance the doctrinal frontier. Um, there's the possibility of using the administrative adjudication mechanism to do that. And if that's not used robustly, the whole rationale for having a commission disappears. 
and then you can peel apart the agency and parcel out the pieces to the others so that the, the, the U.S. has a specialized trade court. It's called the Federal Trade Commission, and that arguably should be an important forum for making the kinds of refinements that we're talking about here. To do that effectively, my, my admin law suggestion is you have to change the Sunshine Act. The Sunshine Act disables the, effective, the effectiveness of collaboration. I don't see how administrative adjudication, administrative decision making, collective decision making can succeed if that stays in place. And ultimately, you do have to go and get, for dominant firm stuff, you have to get people like Steve Breyer to change his mind, Barry Wright, joining Trinco as he did, Ocean State, Town of Concord, that's Harvard, sorry. So one, one takeaway from this really good discussion today, I think, is that, uh, or one perspective is that, you know, the antitrust laws are, are pretty adequate. They're flexible, they're durable, uh, they've been around for a long time. Um, they're not super specific. They've given significant latitude to adjust and morph over time or, the, or, or consider different situations over time. And couple that with the fact that the consumer welfare standard, if, and, it, and only if it is interpreted to the full extent of what the standard can capture in terms of price, non-price effects, uh, so quality, innovation, choice, variety, all these things, um, and it is interpreted in a more dynamic context to avoid the pitfalls that we are now suffering from, from a very static view of, of or measurement or, or conception of consumer welfare. Um, if you put all that into place and then take it to the next uh, major observation, which is the courts haven't done a good job of enforcing the antitrust laws. So we've got we got okay laws, and we have we've got a good standard, but the courts aren't 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 enforcing the laws, and 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 viewing the standard appropriately. So we now have a sick patient. We have a sick economy. We have a we have sickness associated with declining competition, as measured by any number of metrics: high concentration, growing inequality gaps, lower rates of market entry. So we, we don't have a healthy situation here. Something clearly has gone wrong. So whenever that happens, I don't think you don't, you don't keep feeding the patient the same medications that have not brought the patient to health, but instead you start considering other options, other policy options, other types of, 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 um, of reforms. And in this case, reforms can be reforms uh, light, well, L-I-T-E, not reforms heavy, not junking the laws, not wholesale reforms, getting rid of the standard and putting in a public interest standard, um, but, but reforms that would be actually very effective. And those, those reforms really cover the gamut on the use of the agencies and the agency's resources, exploring Section 5, for example, unfair methods of competition, looking at um, uh, doing more robust studies, merger retrospectives, and learning from those types of studies, but also considering, taking the extra step and considering, are we ready to think about uh, more presumptions, different presumptions that can be embedded in how we go about looking at these cases, but also thinking about requirements. Are we to the point where we should really be mandating the fact that a merged firm, once it consummates, should, should prove up? and prove up its claims efficiencies and say, hey, I actually got my efficiencies from my merger. I think enforcers should see that. Enforcers should also, be, should also see the fact that cost savings were passed on, actually passed on to consumers, as, we, as we've seen in many judges opine in many merger cases. So um, I think these are, um, th that's one way to view the whole picture in terms of where we are now. There's certainly lots of room for policy research and for uh, legal and economic and institutional multidisciplinary research to, to move this along. But clearly something has to change. Okay, Bobby. Yeah, well I'm back on my theme of it's time to get serious about guidelines. And the reason I say that is in the past, I think the economics community when faced with the serious challenge has more or less declined, uh, in part because our toolkit of theories of templates was much more limited than the outpouring of feelings that people have about things going wrong. We didn't really have models that could stand up to those feelings of distress about business conduct. I think that's changed. I think now we have a very broad toolkit, maybe too broad, for templates for how to think about the kinds of business practices that trouble the community. And it's time to sit down and shop through our, our library of theories and force ourselves with the agencies and with the lawyers to look for what the signs of evidence are appropriately uh, 
used to call a particular template about bad practices into court, into intervention activity. I don't think we've done that enough, but I think pushing ourselves to write guidelines that say this is the evidence that would make this theory be real and apply to that set of facts, put that forward will help to shape business conduct and also help to shape the activities, intervention activities of the agencies. And I think we're ready to do that now. Great panel, thank you everyone. And I'll close by saying that's all folks. <laughs>